It is now the 1st of March, which means it has been about six weeks since I started working on the story grid. Admittedly, I haven't been doing it the entire time, but I have attempted to do this process probably on four or five separate occasions now, and I've really been struggling. However, it is March, which means I am a good two months behind on my New Year's resolution to write two new books this year, which means I am determined to get this done. Originally, I thought I would get it done today. However, I've been working on it for, what, three and a half, four and a half hours now? I can't remember exactly when I started. Because of that, it means um, my mind is getting a little bit worn out, so I don't know if I'll get to the end. If I do get to the end, I might not be able to film the outro of this video today, but I have made progress, which is something. As you know, the story grid method has a few different steps. The first is the six different questions that editors ask themselves, which I did back at the beginning of the process. After that, there is then the one page full scap method, where, which is basically a one page outline of your book. And then there is the actual story grid spreadsheet. Now today I've been working on the one page outline. The reason it's taken me so long to do this one page outline is because the book <laughs> lacks information on how to fill it out, to be completely honest. Um, it has a lot of examples based on Silence of the Lambs, it talks a bit about the thriller genre, but if you're not writing in the thriller genre it's a little bit difficult. So what I then did was I went to the Story Grid website to see if I could find any more information on the blog, and it turns out I did. So there are a number of really helpful articles which take deep dives into different genres. So the ones that were helpful for me are the action genre and the love genre. I've actually, since the last time I filmed, I've actually decided to stop focusing on the cannibal superhuman book, which would have been Thriller. The reason for that is because even though I've started with Snowflake Method and Story Grid, neither of the methods have sparked new ideas, so I think that one just needs to marinate for a bit longer. So I'm focusing on two ideas now. One is the Dream Spy, which is action, and one is the Reciprocal Stalking, which is love slash obsession. Now these blog posts are really helpful because one, they outline the obligatory scenes of the genre, which the book does not. Two, they talk about the three-act structure and what needs to happen in each of the acts. They talk about the emotional journey a protagonist should take based on the five stages of grieving, and those are the three main things they add to what is covered in the book. Now, this makes things a little bit confusing, because what it means is there are three different outlining methods you need to follow. So the first one is what's covered in the full scap method. The one page full scap is divided into three different acts, and each act has an inciting incident, a complication, a crisis, a climax, and a resolution. So if you times that by three, that's 15 different scenes. Then you have the obligatory scenes for the genre. For the love genre, it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten scenes. And for action, it was three, seven, eight, nine. So then you've got another ten-ish scenes to look at. Then there's the three-act structure, and the way this was outlined in the blog posts, it lists another one, two, well, 17 scenes, 17 beats. So I saw this, and then I just decided to cut out the stages of grief part of it because it wasn't adding anything for me, which means I had three different scene types I needed to brainstorm. So what I did then was I did a list of ideas for the obligatory scenes that I needed to hit in each of my books. I then looked at the three-act structure. Now when I was looking at the three-act structure, there were a couple of references to the hero's journey, and I did some googling to get some more clarity around the different scenes, because even though I'm familiar with the hero's journey in an abstract sense, so I'm aware of how it works, I know some of the major beats, I haven't actually read Joseph Campbell's work, so I'm by no means well versed, and there were a couple of scenes where I wasn't 100% sure what was required. So one of them was the ordeal, and another one was the apotheosis, apotheosis, <laughs> or crisis. When I was googling this, I actually came across a guy who's done, I assume it's a guy, might be a girl, I came across someone who has lined up the hero's journey with the story grid which I thought was excellent and so much more helpful than anything I've found via Sean and the Story Grid stuff. So I will include links to those blog posts in the description below. 
but basically he had his list of I think it's 17 different steps or beats from the hero's journey and then he lined up where basically what matched the required inciting incident complication crisis climax and resolution for each of the acts in the story grid framework. Now what was interesting then was when I started addressing the points from the three act structure slash hero's journey I found that really helpful but when I then started transferring that into the full scat I found that I didn't get any extra value from doing the full scat method so for me story grid has not been that helpful it would have been far easier just to go straight to Joseph Campbell and do that way. What I have now is an A3 piece of paper for each of these books which I divided into columns. One column was Hero's Journey, next column was the full scap points, so those five scenes that happen in each act. Then there was the three act structure points that were covered in the story grid blog posts which pretty much align with the Hero's Journey and then there was a column for obligatory scenes. Once I had done this for each of the ideas I then wanted to see if I could link them up into a single narrative and put them into my one page summary as per the story grid method. Now I did this I actually don't feel like the one page overview is that helpful though and the reason I think this is because when I look at an inciting incident complication crisis climax and resolution I see that as a sequence of scenes and it by no means covers all of the scenes I need in the book and because of the relationship those scenes or beats need to each other or need to have with each other I don't even think this covers the most important things that happen in the book it just happens to cover things that happen at the right point and fit the criteria of an inciting incident and so on so I didn't love the full scap method even though I'm very happy I've done it and I've taken a step forward However, I do like the idea of grouping these five stages. So, and I like the idea of grouping them almost on a scene by scene basis. So you could almost say every scene has an inciting incident that sets a scene in motion. Every scene should have a complication. So something goes wrong or something gets more complex or something unexpected happens that raises the stakes. There should be a crisis. And the crisis is actually what will the character do now? So if I look at the example in Story Grid, this example is for Silence of the Lambs and in each of the three parts the crisis is actually a question about what will Starling do next. So in Act 1 we've got crisis, does Starling re-engage Lecter after discovering the head in the storage unit? Should Starling rebel and investigate by herself or should she listen to the FBI? And in Act 3, it's does Starling quit her investigation or does she continue? So I really like that approach because I don't think any of the other plotting methods I've looked at have you know, looked at the choices the protagonist needs to make at each stage of the journey. So I see value in it from that perspective. As an overall plotting method, I don't really like these five beats or scenes, but as an approach to looking at individual scenes I think it could be really helpful so I might try to integrate this when I get to a scene by scene overview of my book. So now I've got my A3 bit of paper for each of the books which was not actually part of the story grid process it's just something I thought I had to do in order to do the story grid process because the story grid process it's sort of like you're going straight to step five and you haven't taken the steps so you have step one which is the six questions which I think is good and then this is like step five and it doesn't cover the two three and four in between so a three bit of paper was my steps two three and four this is my one page full scap and the next stage is doing the story grid spreadsheet the story grid spreadsheet is predominantly an editing tool and I'm not sure how useful it's going to be as a plotting outlining tool but I'm committed to the process so we'll see. So to create the story grid spreadsheet open a blank spreadsheet and you'll need to add the following labels to the columns scene, word count, story events, value shift, polarity shift, turning point, point of view, period slash time, duration, location, on stage characters and off stage characters. So scene is actually the scene number so scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four word count is the word count of the scene now because this is an editing tool this is generally used once you've already written the book and it's a tool that helps you see how balanced your book is so if you have 
some scenes or chapters that are 800 words and some that are 5,000 words. If that's not intentional, that probably means there's something off with the balance of your book. Story event is the main event that happens in a scene, so it's summing up the scene in a phrase or sentence. Now, value shift refers to the main values of the story. This is something Sean is quite big on in the podcast I've heard him speak in, as well as in the book and in the blog. He basically says there is a value spectrum for every book and every genre. So for the thriller, which I'm using as an example because it's the only one he really talks about in the book, the value is life or death, or he says life, death or damnation. So damnation is a fate worse than death. And when he talks about the value shift in this spreadsheet, it's how does the value change? Does it move towards the positive end of the spectrum, which is life? Does it move towards the negative end of the spectrum, which is towards death and damnation? Polarity shift is how much the value shifts and in which direction. So plus would be towards life, minus would be towards death, plus plus would be significantly towards life, minus minus would be significantly towards death, and so on. Turning point is when a scene shifts from positive to negative or vice versa. Point of view is self-explanatory. Whose point of view is this scene from? Period or time is when does this take place? So is it daytime, nighttime, weekend, weekday, etc. Duration is about how long this event takes in the world of the story. Uh, location is where the scene takes place. On stage characters are characters who are featured in the scene, and then off stage characters are characters that you don't see but who have some input or may be affected in some way by what happens in the scene. So, I don't actually know how I'm going to jump from the full scap to this. Um, the big challenge, I mean, the big challenge is, is that. There's a whole lot of theory in the book between the introduction of the full scap and the introduction of this spreadsheet, but it isn't practical stuff. Like there aren't exercises to help you develop things further. It's like, no, you've got this summary and now complete a full spreadsheet for a book. Basically as if it's already been written. Um, I am aware this is an editing tool rather than a brainstorming tool. I might um, have shot myself in the foot with this exercise, but I'll brainstorm and see how I go. I think the fact that I've already done more than the full scout, the fact that I've also looked at the hero's journey and the obligatory scenes might help here. I'm not going to have a complete outline for the book. Like I don't expect to jump back on camera in half an hour and have a list of 40 scenes and know exactly what's happening. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how far I get with this. So I will check back soon. So I just spent the last half hour talking to the camera only to realize that for some reason it wasn't recording. So that's a little bit annoying, but the good news for you is that hopefully it means I will be more efficient this time in my rant about StoryGrid. So I have done my StoryGrid spreadsheet for the Dream Spy story and I found it, I actually found it useful because it got me thinking about scenes in a way I hadn't thought about them yet. So. In terms of like the story event, which is the one sentence summary of what the scene's about, I had already written that down, but I hadn't thought about things like the value shift, the polarity shift, or the turning point for each of these scenes. So some of the examples of value shifts I have are from progress to failure, from triumph to unease, from fear to determination, from hopelessness to hope. The polarity shift is basically from negative to positive, or positive to more positive, and negative to more negative. And then the turning point, I was a little bit confused about how this differed from the value shift. So I looked at the story grid book where Sean has actually done, he's completely mapped out the silence of the lambs. And he said that the turning point he divides into action or revelation. So the protagonist takes an action that changes the course of the scene or the protagonist has a, res or the protagonist has a revelation that changes the course of the scene. So some of the things I've got here are Action hides package, or revelation starts to see the links between the real world and the dream world. So it was interesting to have the opportunity to think about my scenes in that way. What else is interesting is that Save the Cat actually has a similar method. So when you do the storyboard exercise in Save the Cat, which is you have a board and you need to write each scene on a card and organize them to your liking, on each card you're supposed to do the emotional change as well as whether it's from negative to positive or positive to negative. So 
What's interesting is even though I have essentially done this in the past, I wouldn't have done it of my own accord if I hadn't been asked to. So the good thing about doing this exercise at this stage in the process is it was forcing me to think a little bit more deeply about the scenes I had in mind. Now, the downside of doing this now is that there is, this is really just a documentation tool. It is ultimately an editing tool. So it's something you can use to map out a book like in a sort of bird's eye view and get a sense for how it works. And given that I don't have a book yet, I don't have that much to put in here. So at the moment I've only got 14 scenes listed and there was no guidance for how to think of other scenes that I hadn't already thought of. So not the best exercise to do now. However, I do think it has merits from an editing standpoint and I would like to try using this when I'm revising my next project. So this actually brings me to the end of the story grid process. There is actually one final thing in the book which is also called the story grid but it's basically the same information that's included here just in a different format so I'm, I'm gonna call it quits. <laughs> Plus it's also getting dark, I'm ready for dinner so I'm done. It's been six weeks, I'm done with this process. <laughs> so how did I find the story grid? This probably isn't going to be a surprise to anyone watching this video given how much I have complained about the process so far, but I did not enjoy it. I found it incredibly frustrating. I admit that because I have followed it, I do have more now than I had at the beginning of the process. At the beginning of the process, I had sort of a one sentence idea. Now I've got 14 scenes, so it has helped me make progress. However, I think I could have made that progress much more quickly if I had used a different method rather than trying to push ahead with this one. So what didn't work about it? There are a few different things. The first one is that the book, so this book right here, it's not very well organized. And I think the main reason for this is that the bulk of the content has come from Sean's story grid blog. I don't think there's anything wrong with repurposing content from your blog for a book, if, especially if you're a nonfiction writer and you're already writing a blog on the topic that your book will be on, then absolutely you should make the most of the resources you already have. However, that doesn't mean you just copy and paste all of your blog posts into a book and put a cover on it and print it. I mean, you can do that and some people do, but in my experience, that approach does not create the best books. And the reason for that is because blog posts and books work differently. So a blog post is supposed to be this standalone resource, which might range from a few hundred to a few thousand words. A book is supposed to be a much longer resource that goes into much more depth. And if you're just copying blog posts, you have a couple of issues. One is that you will never go into depth because you're not adding anything. All you have is essentially a collection of high level essays. And the second thing is it does tend to lead to a lot of repetition simply because, because every blog post is a standalone piece of work. It needs to be introduced, it needs to be concluded, and it's probably going to cover content that you've covered in other blog posts just because it's standalone. In your book, if you're putting it all together, you want to cut a lot of that fat because you want to respect your reader's time basically and give them what you want. I think the first issue with this book was that it was a collection of blog posts it didn't go into as much depth as it could have and that meant it didn't deliver the value it could have delivered to the reader. One of the symptoms of that was that there was simply missing information. So Sean had quite a good in-depth discussion on genres, which I covered earlier in this video, and he has this five petal approach to genres. So there's a lot there. Then one of the things he says is that every genre has obligatory scenes and conventions. He also talks about how different genres have different controlling themes and different values that they address. The problem is he doesn't cover this for any of the genres he listed. And the main problem here is that if you're introducing a bunch of genres, you're setting the expectation that you are going to be discussing these in your book. If you just say, oh, romance is a genre, and then just say nothing else about romance, what's the point? So I would have been I would have thought much more highly of this book if it had just been positioned as a book on how to write a thriller rather than this ultimate guide on how to write a great book because it wasn't an ultimate guide on how to write a great book and admittedly I was able to go to his website and get more information on the genres I was writing but I shouldn't have had to have gone to his website to get that information because the book is supposed to be a standalone in-depth resource. Now, if you want to offer me a bonus resource as a reader, so perhaps you've mapped out a story grid for 
a book that I've read and I really want to get it, then that's absolutely fine and I'm very happy to go to your website and sign up for that extra resource. But to introduce a topic in your book and then not cover it at all, I mean, that's um, disrespectful of my time and my investment in your book, especially since this was not a cheap book. It was recommended retail price was 33 euros, which is fairly high, at least in this part of the world. The other thing that made this book a little bit difficult was that it was so academic and theoretical. And I think that Sean is an enthusiast when it comes to books and literature and writing theories. And as a fellow enthusiast, I can understand you know, how exciting it is to see, like, to understand the hero's journey, for instance, and then see how it applies to all of these different stories and to come up with all of these different theories and see how they apply. The problem is that although that is interesting to discuss from an academic perspective and interesting to discuss with other editors and writers from a theoretical perspective, when you're offering someone a practical guide for how they can write a good book, you don't need to cover all of these different angles. I mean, honestly, simple is often best. And if you can have like one list of scenes that someone should hit, that's far easier than what I had earlier, which was I had three separate lists of scenes that had all come from him. And I was the one, I was the one who had to figure out how they all went together. Whereas the book should have been teaching me like one, it either should have put them all together for me and just given me one comprehensive list that I should look at or it should have told me how to put them together myself, but it didn't. So there was a big gap between the theoretical academic discussion and how to use it practically. Linked to that criticism is the fact that there was very little in this book that was practical at all. So of this 330-ish page book, there were, let's say four exercises. One was the six questions. One was the full scan method. One was the story grid, like spreadsheet, and one was the story grid spreadsheet, but basically formatted in a different way. You know, that's not a lot considering the amount of information that was there. And when it comes to how it was structured, so I'm going to open up the table of contents so you can see how few and far between these, these practical pieces were. So we have part one, which is 38 pages, and that's an introduction. It's basically about Sean and his background. Now, I think introductions are fine. Yes, introduce yourself, demonstrate your credibility, and tell your readers what they're gonna get. 38 pages is a bit long, and if after this video you are still determined to read this book, I would skip straight to part two. Part two is genre, and genre, he begins a section with, there are six questions that editors ask about any book that you should be able to answer. The section itself is quite long. Um, he introduces all of the different types of genres. He says they have obligatory scenes and conventions. He basically breaks down each of the five genre petals. So that is, what, 45 pages of the book. I remember reading this thinking, like, it's quite long and I would like to have something to do, but honestly, this was probably one of the better parts of the book. Like, I had my six questions. At the end of this section, I could answer the six questions. From here, it gets a bit messy. So we have part three, which is when he introduces the full scalp global story grid method. So he introduces the one page outline at the beginning of this. And then for the rest of this part, he has, this is where it gets really bloggy. He has a bunch of chapters, which are basically essays on different thoughts. So some examples are the universal appeal of the thriller, the power of negative thinking, free and direct style, point of view, controlling ideas slash theme, and so on. So, you know, all of it's interesting in an academic sense, but I'm not reading this book as an academic study on fiction writing. I'm writing this book to teach me how to do something. I want to know how to do it. So we get to the end of this section and he gives an example of the full scap in action using Silence of the Lambs. Still nothing on how to fill it out though. Then we get to part four, which is story form. And these are the five commandments of storytelling. And these are those five points you need to hit in each of the acts of your story. So the inciting incident, the, oh, now I've got to remember it complication, crisis, climax, and resolution. So each of those gets a chapter. Some of them get more than one chapter because he wants to talk about them in more detail. Then we get to part five, which is the units of story. So he talks about the beat, the scene, the sequence, the act, the subplot, and the global story. Then we get to part six, which is when he introduces the story grid spreadsheet. 
So this is the spreadsheet with one scene for each row and then columns about value, point of view, polarity shift, and so on. All of that from when he first introduced the full scat method is 100, almost 150 pages. So it's from page 107 to page 254. Then we get into part seven, which is building the full scale global story grid. And here, first he revisits genre, so the six questions, all good. Then he talks about filling in the full scale. This is page 262, and this was my, this was the highest moment for me, my high point in reading this book, because I went, oh yes, this is, this is it. Now he's going to bring everything together and all of the previous stuff is going to make sense and it'll work. And yes, this might not be how I personally would have structured this book, but now it's going to be usable. Yeah, it, it wasn't great. So I had about four pages of feeling like, yes, I'm going to get this. And then he went back to Silence of the Lambs and just showed how it worked there. Now, if it had been me writing this book or if I had been his editor, the way I would have structured this was... I mean, I would have cut out maybe a third of the content in this 150 pages. But in each section, I would have had small exercises for the reader to start working on. So for the Five Commandments, for instance, um, in the inciting incident, I would have explained what an inciting incident is. I would have given examples from more stories than just the Silence of the Lambs. And I would have had an exercise around thinking of the inciting incident for each of the three acts in the book. And um, I would have also discussed how these incidents vary for each of the acts of the book. So then at the end of that chapter, so then at the end of that chapter, the reader would have had an inciting incident for all three parts of their book. And the same thing with the other four events. And what that means, and this is just one example, I would have done the same thing with like genre and controlling theme and external value and internal value so that when we get to this piece at the end where they need to fill out their full scat one page sheet they would have actually already had all of the information and it was just a matter of putting it into the template instead what happened in this book is i got to part seven so 255 pages into the book and it was time for me to do the exercise and all of the stuff that had come before was a bit fuzzy because i hadn't had to do anything to like make it concrete, to make it stick in my head. It's sort of all just merged into, I don't know, a blob of <sighs> literary writing academia. But anyway, so we have part seven, which is the full scab. And um, he gives the examples of Silence of the Lambs. And then part eight, we have the story grid, which is putting it all together. Here he does not discuss the story grid spreadsheet which is how he introduced the story grid in part six. Here he has the story grid as a list of scenes and zigzags going across the top of it to demonstrate the change in the external and the internal value of the protagonist in the book. I suppose if you like zigzags, it looks nice, but it doesn't actually have any new information that wasn't already in the spreadsheet. All in all, <laughs> reading this was a very frustrating experience. I would have written it very differently. I would have included a lot more um, when it came to different genres, or I would have marketed it as just a book on how to write a thriller. But my general feedback is it was poorly organized. It was highly theoretical and academic. There was very little practical information and there was very little guidance when it came to the practical exercises. Um, and because there was so much space between the practical stuff and all of the theory, it was hard to remember the theory you needed by the time you were asked to put it into action. And the final challenge I had was that I felt like there were three main exercises. So the six questions, the full scap and the spreadsheet, not including the last story grid because it's the spreadsheet in a different format. There were very big leaps that needed to take place between each of those. So the six questions were fairly easy once you'd been through that part of the book. To get from the six questions to the full page full scap though, there was, like it was a really big leap to go from one to the next. Um, and you can see that because there was 150 pages between them. And I think that having smaller exercises throughout would have helped bridge that gap. And then to go from the full scap to the story grid spreadsheet, there was also a very big gap because the full scap ultimately only has 15 scenes because you've got your five key scenes for each of the three acts. So to go from that to having a complete book outlined in a spreadsheet is a really big gap. And this one did not have 
like the defense of having covered it all in theory and maybe I just didn't pick it up. Like there was nothing in between covering all of the information I needed to do the one pager and then covering all of the information I needed to go from 15 scenes to 40, 50, 60 scenes. Having said that, the story grid spreadsheet is predominantly an editing method rather than a plotting method. However, he did position it as it was possible to use it for plotting as well, which it might be, but I don't think it was presented in a way where it's usable for people who just have an idea. So ultimately, I found the story grid to be a very frustrating process. I wish I had never picked up this book, <laughs> to be completely honest. The truth is that I have made some progress using it. I have a list of 14 scenes now, whereas when I first picked this up, I had a one sentence idea. So, and it'll be similar when I do the spreadsheet for the reciprocal stalking book as well. So there has been some value, however, I think I could have gotten that value a lot faster and with a lot less frustration if I'd used a different method. And the only reason I persisted for so long was because I had this video <laughs> and honestly, and I did consider not doing it, but I already had quite a bit of footage and so I was determined to see it through if I could. Having said that, maybe you're different and maybe you'll find value in this process. So if you are someone who has used the story grid for plotting or even for revising and editing a book, please let me know in the comments below and let me know, let me know what you like about it and also whether you found any hacks to make it easier to use or whether you combine the story grid with another method to fill in the gaps I mentioned. Other than that, if you like this video, please give me a big thumbs up. I did really suffer for it. If you like the idea of plotting and different plotting experiments, please subscribe and hit the notification bell because I am trying two more plotting methods before I get started on my next project. I also have a plotting playlist. So if you're interested in learning about story engineering or take off your pants or save the cat, please check that out. I've got the link in the description. And now it has been almost another half hour. So I am signing off. I am having a bath because I have earned it. Goodbye for now.